Jesus said, I am the way, the what? Truth and, uh, and the life. And there's only one Jesus. So there's only one truth. And that truth is absolute. That's what I like to use. That's the word I like to use in describing truth. It's absolute, which means that there's only one. There's only one truth. There's only one God. And truth is not one thing to one person and something else to somebody else. It's not relative. Truth is the same. It's constant. Um, when you think of truth, you think of God. And his name is what? Jesus. And whatever God is, that's what truth is. Now, truth also is dispensational. It's dispensational. What that means is uh, truth is uh, for the period of time of which it is in force. And there are different periods of truth. For example, the truth in Moses' day was the law, the Ten Commandments, 613 ordinances that govern Israel's worship, the Sabbath days, the feast days, so on and so forth. There was a truth in Abraham's day that God gave to him. The Bible says that God preached the gospel unto Abraham, which was the good news, saying that in you, Abraham, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And I'm going to multiply your seed like the stars of the sky, sand upon the seashore. That if you can number the sands of the seed, that's how many children you're going to have. If you can number the stars in heaven, that's how many children you're going to have, even though at the time he didn't have not one child. All right? Uh, and that God made a covenant of circumcision with Abraham. Uh, and so the truth that was in Abraham's day, the truth that was in Moses' day, and of course in Noah's day, they walked with God based upon their conscience. They didn't have a written law of God. Uh, that didn't occur until Moses received the law of God from Mount Sinai, which was roughly a period of um, 2,500 years from Adam to Moses getting the law on Ten Commandments, on uh, Ten Commandments of Two Tables of Stone written by the finger of God from the stone that he cut out of Mount Sinai, God did with his finger, the Bible says. And so that was the truth in that day. It was the truth in Abraham's day. Now the truth in our day is not the same truth it was in Abraham's day. Even though Abraham's day, the truth that he had was the truth for that time, but it's not the truth for our time. The truth for our time is except a man be born of the water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And that being born of water and spirit, we know, is water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and being filled with the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking other tongues and living a holy life free from sin. That's the truth for this period. Or that's the truth for this dispensation. A dispensation is a period of truth. Now, the truth in the tribulation period will not be the same truth that, it is, that is right now. But the truth in the tribulation period would be not to take the mark of the beast and that they would have to die, give their lives to be saved. That will be their salvation, giving their lives. So... The truth uh, in that day will be different in our day. It's different in our day. Then you have the millennial reign. The truth in that day would be that all of the nations that have been left, that have survived, all of the peoples that have survived, the wrath of God during that seven-year tribulation period will be, will be required once a year to go up to Jerusalem and worship the king and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, that will be the truth in their day. And, of course, if they don't adhere to that truth, then the judgment of God will come upon them. So when we say truth is dispensational, according to the Bible, it's relative to the period of which it existed. Uh, but truth is absolute according to the dispensation that it is in force. 
Can we say amen? And the truth in our day is the plan of salvation. Now, that's why when you talk to people, and I've talked to people in time past and witnessed to them and told them that you have to repent, you have to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. They say, well, Moses wasn't baptized. Uh, Abraham didn't speak in tongues. Well, that's because that was not the dispensational truth for their time. The dispensational truth for our time is the new birth. And so that's what we mean when we say that truth is dispensational. All right? And who establishes the truth? God establishes the truth because he is the truth. He is the essence of truth. He is all that truth is, was, or could ever be. Truth. That's what he is. And when we say that truth is dispensational and that truth is different depending upon the period of time that it is in force, if God is the truth, then what we're saying then is that God revealed himself in a certain fashion in various different periods to man that we call truth. It has to do with him revealing an essence of himself that people were to um, follow, adhere to, and obey based upon the period that they were in. It was all about the revelation of himself within that period of time because we're talking about truth and he is the truth. Moses said, his, he is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So when we deal with truth dispensationally, we're dealing with God revealing uh, to some degree himself to man to glean from, to learn from, and to follow. Can we say amen? amen? Abraham did not know God as Jesus. He knew him as El Shaddai. El Shaddai, which has to do with God supplying the needs of his people. And in order for Abraham to be what God determined him to be, God had to provide for him a son. He knew him as um, El Shaddai. He also knew him, well, when we say El Shaddai, that means God Almighty. God Almighty. And in one place, the scripture says that he... Uh, called on the name of the everlasting God because that was a portion of revelation of truth that God had revealed to Abraham at that time and he passed it on to his children. Moses knew him as what? Jehovah or I am that I am. So in the dispensation of the law and prophets uh, starting with Moses God revealed uh, an essence of himself to Moses or he brought forth an element of truth that was different than Abraham's day but greater than it was in Abraham's day because God revealed things of himself that were not known before. Let me say amen. And he gave them the law try to show them what holiness was. God gave them the law and the reason why he gave them the law was to show them what righteousness was. Before they didn't have that. The world didn't have that. To show them what righteousness was. What holiness was. And even though they, they could not keep it, but they could see it. They could see what it was. God was, was revealing an element of himself. So when you, talk about, when you talk about truth, you're talking about God himself. 
the essence of himself, the manifestation of himself, of his will, of his purpose, of his mind, of his thoughts, of his desires, the things that are upon his heart, his truth. He is the truth. You say amen. And so now today, um, we are in the church dispensation. Or oh, we're in the era of truth that God has revealed himself more in this era than he has in any other previous era. He has revealed and he is getting for the first time what he has never gotten in any other era previous to this time and that is a holy people. He's getting it from the, for the first time. A holy people. The level of truth in our day is greater than any day that ever was and probably any other day that ever will be uh, uh, with the exception of, well, if you want to talk about the new heaven and new earth period, uh, there are things that we're going to find out then that we didn't know uh, now. Uh, we know in part now, but then once the rapture takes place, then shall we know even as we are known. We will know as God knows us now. But um, that is just a different uh, dimension of God's plan altogether, the seventh day. Because that's the day he's going to what? He's going to rest on that day from all his works that he created and made. So that's just a completely different uh, dimension of God's time altogether. But the truth in our day. Now, truth is important because the order of our day is deception. That's the biggest thing that we deal with today is deception. And the deception is strong, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And so in this dispensation that we are in, where we have God's truth, God's truth can only be preserved as it is handed down the way he has designed for it to be done. His truth is to be handed down and he taught this to the children of Israel and we were to look at it and follow the same example. Now when a child was born, a Jewish child was born, the first thing the mother would say in the ears of that child after it was brought out of her womb and put up to her breast for her to nurse that child, the first thing she said to that child was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is what? One Lord. From the time they came out of the womb and for the rest of their lives as they were growing up as children in a Jewish home, a child, a Jewish boy, uh, when he was 12 years old, he took his, he was given his phylacteries and his prayer shawl and he took his place in the synagogue as a man. And at 12 years old, he probably knew the scriptures better than you and I uh, would know him at 12 years old. We do know that Timothy had the truth, the scriptures put in him by his grandmother and his mother. And he knew the scriptures better than you and I would ever hope to learn them in a lifetime of study. The Jewish children did. They knew that. And that's because of it being handed down. Um, and so, um, but today it's not like that because people are rejecting truth. As Paul said, the time will come when many will not endure sound doctrine, but shall heap to themselves teachers having what? Itching ears. The people have the itching ears and the teachers are there to satisfy their itching ears. Well, as we deal with succession of truth and uh, we're dealing with truth being handed down, the importance of truth being passed on from generation to generation, the importance of that. Well, let us go to Deuteronomy chapter number four and verse one through 10. Deuteronomy chapter four, verse number one through 10. Deuteronomy 4, verse 1 through 10. God had instructed Israel, instructed Moses, that the truth concerning himself is to be handed down and taught to the children. Let 
Deuteronomy 4 and verse number 1. All right. And if we have it, let's read. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers, what? Notice that I teach you for to do them uh, that ye may what? Live. You want to live. I'm going to teach you so that you can do them so you can live. Verse number two. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I... Now, if you take away from it, you can't keep it. If you add to it, you can't keep it. Why? Because if you take away from it or add to it, it ceases to become truth. It's something else now. It's not, and, and it's something else. What is the something else it has become? It has become something that is not from him. See, the devil has always been a corrupter of the word of God. We learn that out of the book of Genesis. Because when the word of the Lord was given to Adam and him being a prophet passed it on to his wife and the devil came and the devil came and tried Eve as to what God said and he said, yeah, God don't want you to eat of any of these trees. He said, oh no, we can eat of the tree but there's one we can't eat of. Uh, if we eat of that, we're gonna die. He said, you're not gonna die. You know, God knows that if you eat of that tree, you're gonna be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, then that awakened something in her and, and of course she became corrupted. But he used what God said and added to it and put a twist to it, told a half truth and deceived her. And this is what he does today. So uh, you have people diminishing from it. You have people adding to it and it ceases to become truth. It becomes something else. All right, well, what does it become? Well, it becomes a lie. Or it becomes a half-truth, whatever. It becomes polluted, corrupted. Let's read on. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God had destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land whether you go to possess it. Now, Moses is about to die and he is now rehearsing the law of God to the children of those Israelites that came out of Egypt but did not believe God when it came time to inherit the promised land and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and died out there in the wilderness. He's now talking to the children of those fathers. And so, um, that's what Deuteronomy is. The whole book is a rehearsal of what God had told Israel 40 years earlier. This is Moses. He has outlived all of those people. And he is now about 120 years old and he's about to die and God has instructed him to instruct the children of those fathers so that when they go in to possess the land they will be what they should be that they may live okay all right so um, verse number six he says well hold it first of all verse five he says behold I have taught you what statutes and judgments even as the Lord my God what commanded me now this is a church that numbered about four million people Moses taught them the judgments and the statutes. He taught them. All right. Verse six. Keep therefore and do them for this is your wisdom and your what? Understanding in the sight of the nations. Your wisdom and your understanding is you keeping the statutes and the what? 
judgments. When we hear and receive and obey the word of God, that's our wisdom. That's our what? Understanding. He says, keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and what? Understanding people. The word of God, adherence to the word of God, will bring wisdom and great understanding. That's why people come to you for advice. Can we say amen? I'm quite sure somebody has come to all of you all at some point in time for some advice. And I got my allergies, why my eyes are watering. Because God has given you wisdom and understanding because of your receive or your hearing, receiving, and your adherence to his judgments, his statutes, his word. All right? Let's read on. Surely a uh, 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 wise and understanding people. Verse number seven. For what nation is there so great who hath God so, so nigh unto him, unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? For what nation is there so great who hath, well, well, I'm, well, I'm starting reading verse seven over again. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? The nation of Israel was the only nation that was close to him. They were close to God and God was close to them. We are close to God and God is what? close to us. Oh yeah, he's close. There is no other people in the world like the people of God that we can call upon him for. Verse 8, and what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day. Now, the apostolic church is the greatest church upon the face of the earth. What church is so nigh unto God than we are? And so why is it then that those that are in the faith feel that they need to fraternize and fellowship with other churches that are not nigh unto God? We say amen. <laughs> because there is a lust. That's why. There is a lust, and it is a lust that some of us want what they got that we don't have. And the problem is, is that because we are looking, not under Jesus, but we're looking at them. You follow what we're saying? Oh, yeah, David said, when I beheld the prosperity of the wicked, my foot, what? <laughs> so what was he supposed to do? Get some non-slippery shoes? You got to do what? Somebody said, look, it ain't going to hurt. Yes, it do hurt sometime. Yes, it do hurt sometime. Well, I heard a preacher, I heard a suffering bishop say, well, if the woman walks down the street, there's nothing wrong with looking. Well, yes, there is sometimes. Well, David said, my foot almost what? He said, I almost fell down and broke my neck. Well, he didn't say all that. He said, my foot almost slipped. You can't look around. If you're going to look somewhere, Look unto Jesus, the what? Author and finisher. That's what we're supposed to be looking to. Because Jesus is looking at us also. Like Bishop Tyson said, the looker is looking on you. What are you looking for? <laughs> you know, he's looking to see if we're looking at him. But we're looking at somebody else. We're looking at, and I have, and, 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 and I have to learn that too. You know, pastor 17 years. We don't have two, 300 members here. You know, I can't be looking at what this pastor got over there. Oh, he's only been pastor for five years. Look what all he's got over there. And I'm looking over here. Oh, look what they got. They only been pastor. Oh, they've been pastor the same amount of time. Look what they got. How come I don't have that? We ain't supposed to be looking at that. That's what Jesus told Peter. In the 21st chapter of the gospel according to St. John. I think it's the 21st chapter of St. John. When Jesus told Peter, look, you're going to die a martyr's death. And Peter said, what about John? What's going to happen to him? 
<laughs> Jesus said, what if I will that he lives until I get back? What is that to you? You follow me. That's the greatest sermon Bishop James Johnson ever preached that I've ever heard him preach. An inflexible directive. And see, that's the problem. Looking in the wrong places. Can we say amen? Looking at the wrong things. Look unto Jesus, the author and consider uh, author finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. And the next verse says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners, lest she faint in your weary minds. We have to consider Jesus. We say amen. We got we to look at him. Look over here. I can't. I'm looking at Jesus. There he is. I see him. They that are blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I ain't talking about seeing him when the rapture takes place. You can see him right now. We say amen. Yes, sir. You can see him right now. Well, uh, we don't need to be looking at these other folk, and I ain't looking to them. But uh, verse number nine, only take heed to what? Take heed to who? Thyself. Now, Moses, the father, taught the children. He said, this is what I taught you, children. Succession of truth. He's handing truth down. He's about to be moved out the way, and they're about to move into place, and so he's trying to give them the truth that God gave him. Because if it kept him, it's going to keep them. All right? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul what? Diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Now you look at the great things that God has done for you up to this point. Can you imagine a time coming that you actually forget what he's done for you? That's what happens when people, when they backslide. God has done some great things. Can we say amen? Done some great things in your life. How can a person get to the point to where as great of things that God has done and that they're fresh in your mind and that you're excited about it and get to the point to where you actually forget about it. The Bible says that uh, in the book of Peter, that they have forgotten that they were once purged from their sins. Isn't that something? What a despicable, wretched spiritual state that is to forget what God has done for you, for me. But they do. It's the trick of the enemy. Well, we don't want to forget. How is it that we won't forget? First of all, take heed to yourself. Secondarily, keep your soul diligently. Because if you don't, you will forget what your eyes have seen. Unless they depart from what? Your heart. Remember the parable of the sower? Jesus talked about sower went forth to sow. Some seeds fell by the wayside. Some fell upon stony places. Some fell upon um, what, stony places, the wayside. Uh, some other place, can't remember, and then good ground. Remember that? And one of those has to do with that after the word is sown in your heart, you're shouting and rejoicing, and the devil comes, snatches it out just like that, as though it never was there in the first place. That's what happens to a lot of people when they lose their salvation. And when I say lose it, I'm not saying losing it in the sense that it was taken from them. They threw it away. Just threw it in the garbage like it was nothing. Well, um, that's because, first of all, the child of God stopped taking heed to themselves. You have to watch yourself. You <laughs> say, amen. <laughs> Before you talk about looking out for the devil, where's the devil at? Well, he might be you. Can <laughs> we <You> say, amen? <laughs> Not you, but you know what I'm saying. You have to watch yourself. You have to watch yourself. You have to deal with self first and if you can conquer yourself 
on a regular basis, the devil will just be walking around saying SMH at you because he can't do nothing to you and can't get you to do nothing. He can't get you to cooperate with what he's trying to get done because you are conquering, first of all, what? Yourself. Now, if you can't get yourself under control, you can't do nothing with the devil. <laughs> we say, man, you know, if pleading the blood ain't going to keep you in line, how is it going to make the devil shut up? <laughs> is that right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Sometimes you got to say to yourself, in the name of Jesus. I do. You mean you don't, you don't call on the name against yourself? In the name of Jesus. You ain't thinking that. The blood of Jesus against you. Yeah. <laughs> that old flesh. That old man. That old woman. You say amen. Fear the flesh. There's a new show come out. Fear the walking dead. Well fear the flesh. <laughs> By keeping it dead. Keeping it down. Alright. Well. Only take heed to thyself. Well we already read that. Um, depart from thy heart all the days of life, but teach them to thy sons, thy sons' sons. Verse 10, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach See, they were children back in those days. They were just kids when all these things was happening. Their parents was acting rebellious. And so he's talking about when God came down from Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. It was also called Mount Sinai. And quoted the Ten Commandments out of heaven. And they all stood there and watched it. How can anybody forget something like that? How can they forget? They can forget by not taking heed to themselves. That's how they can forget it. Genesis chapter 18. Let's look at Abraham. Genesis chapter 18. All right. Genesis 18. And verse 17 through 19. Somebody said, well, there's nothing special about Abraham as to why God chose him. Uh, he, was, he could have just chose anybody. Oh, no, there was something special about Abraham. God chose Abraham based upon his foreknowledge. That is, based upon what he knew Abraham would do. All right. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17 through 19. Let's read. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great nation? And mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command, what? His children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath, what? God trusted Abraham. God has called you out of darkness into his what? Marvelous light. That's because he trusts you. See, God is not a one-way God. Can we say amen? He wants us to put our trust in him, and at the same time, he puts his trust in us. That's why he saved us. He says, I have entrusted you with my truth, with my salvation, that you will go forth and witness, invite people to church, live the life, do what I tell you to do. I trust you, and I've chosen you before the foundation of the world, and I've given you this opportunity, and that's what he's done. So we trust him. There's an element of trust he has of us. He's at, he has entrusted us that we will Use what he has given us to his glory. That we will be faithful to him. That he can depend on us. That when the trouble comes and we're hurting and seems like everything is against us and our heart is overwhelmed, we'll say, lead me to the rock that is what? Higher than I. Oh, God trusts you now. He trusts you. 
<laughs> Your brother and sister might say, I just can't trust him. Well, God can trust him. What do you mean you can't trust him? Can we say amen? Just because they made messed up on you, now you, now you can't trust him? <laughs> How many times have we messed up with God and God didn't say, now you know, give me back that Holy Ghost. <laughs> trust you. God ain't did that, did he? See, we harder on ourselves than God is actually harder on us. And he's the boss. Can we say amen? <laughs> he's, he's the boss. Wouldn't that be terrible? The Bible says, John says that, brethren, I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, the possibility. So you have to go in and confess. God don't say, eh, get the Holy Ghost back. What's wrong with you? That'll teach you. Lord, give it. No, I ain't giving it back to you. You know, you know, God don't do that. But look what we do to each other. Is that right? Somebody's on praise the Lord. I don't know what was wrong with her. Well, what's wrong with you? Maybe God made you invisible as they walk by just to see what you going to do. Can we say amen? You don't think God can do that? How many times are, oh, brother, I didn't see you standing there. Well, I was wondering why you didn't say praise the Lord. Well, God is wondering why you didn't say what? <laughs> Maybe God wanted you to say praise the Lord first. You know, <laughs> I, I go back to my mother. We, you know, I told you this many times. It was, it was such, uh, I tell you, she got mad too. She didn't like that. You know, I don't think the pastor liked me. Why? Well, he didn't say praise the Lord to me. I said, well, did you say praise the Lord? No. I said, what's wrong with you? Ain't nothing wrong with me. He didn't want to say praise the Lord. I said, but you didn't say it either. Two wrongs don't make a what? I told her, you as wrong as two left shoes. She said, boy, I've been saved longer than you. I said, don't have nothing to do with it. Jesus is God. Can we say amen? And the word says this. And she told me to get out of her house. And I got out of her house. But she gave me $20 before I left. So, but everything was fine. <laughs> get some pampers. But, um, yeah. See, a lot of times the test is on us. And we don't realize it. We too busy looking at the other person when we supposed to be looking unto who? Jesus. Because when they walked right past you and spoke to the person behind you, maybe God made you invisible it's because the test is going to be on you to see what you're going to do. Now, do you, don't think, you don't think God can make somebody invisible if he want to? God can do anything. Y'all not hearing me. He can do anything. If he can bring water out of a rock, can we say amen? He can put you in a position to have the test be on you or the test be on me. So the brother walked by. Praise the Lord, brother. Brother Phoebus, praise the Lord. Oh, Sister Funches, I didn't see you. That's okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's who them folk are. <laughs> Can we say amen? You know. Because the devil will talk to you real quick. You see, they walk right past you and say, praise the Lord, didn't they? He's fast, ain't he? He walked right past you, didn't he? You know, or somebody walk, you know, praise the Lord, Sister Funches. She just keeps on going. Oh, what's wrong, what's wrong with her? You know what's wrong with her because of what happened last week. You remember what happened last week, don't you? Ain't that how the devil talk? Talk real fast. You be like, over just like that. You be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you're supposed to be saying, yes, Lord, not yeah to what the devil's saying. Take heed to what? <laughs> hold on, wait a minute here. Now, hold on, you, you're talking too fast now. The devil's a fast talker, ain't he? He can be over with quick. Somebody do something, did you see that? I wonder what's wrong with her. It must be about what happened last week. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> ain't that how it happened? It ain't you talking because you can't talk that fast. Can we say amen? So it ain't you. Don't, I thought it was me. You can't talk that fast. All clear and articulate. Can we say amen? You can't talk that fast. You might be a fast talker, but you can't talk that fast. Oh, the devil's a smooth operator. He's a fast talker. You know. 
And you got to see, wait, hold on, hold on. Well, what's, what's going on here? Why am I thinking this concerning my sister? Oh, my brother, why, why am I thinking that? So the pastor says something on the pulpit. It hits you. Mm -hmm. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know he's been talking about you. He talk about you all the time up there in the pulpit. Yeah. And, then, and then you look over at the saint, and they're smiling at you. You say, oh, see, they, yeah, they, know, they, know, they know what you're talking about. They just looking at you smiling because they're happy to see you. And you think they smiled at the, yeah, the, the pastor been talking to them. That's why she's looking at you smiling. Look how she grinned. <laughs> oh, yeah. We got to take heed what? Got to watch yourself. Can we say amen? <laughs> oh, yeah. See, see, the Holy Ghost will not bring to you something bad about somebody else. It will not do that. Now the Holy Ghost may enlighten you about something, but it's for the purpose, but, but when it comes, it comes uh, in, in the vein of what you can do to help that person, that that person needs help. You, 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 you see the difference, right? You know the difference? And the Holy Ghost ain't talking fast. Can we say amen? It's clear so that you can what? Understand it. You know. The devil will come talk to your mind in your own voice, using your own voice. Sounding just like you. And you're like, man, that can't be me. Why, where did that come from? Well, that could be the familiar spirit because the familiar spirit um, sounds just like us, talks like us, manners just like us. Is that right? You know, but God will never bring an indictment to you about your sister concerning what they've done to you to accuse them of something. He doesn't do that. The Holy Ghost don't work that way. But we need to take heed to ourselves. Is that right? All right, so um, we finish here, verse 19. Uh, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath what? Spoken of him. And I believe that there are things that God wants to bring to pass in our lives also. Because, you know, we're the church. We're the, we're, we're the sons of God. Can we say amen? And there's things that God wants to do in our lives. You know, things that he wants to accomplish in our lives. But we've got to make sure that uh, we are in a position to receive those things, the blessings of the Lord. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. All right. Moses again. 6, verse 1 through 8. How much time do we have left? 36 minutes. We got, okay, we can finish this then. Chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Let's read. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to do what? Teach you. There's a command to teach God's people. I don't see how preachers can cancel Bible class for the summer. Well, you might as well cancel it for the winter because half the serve Bible class you're going to cancel in the wintertime anyway. We have a command to do what? Teach. Teach. Teach you. Lord, your God commanded to teach you that ye might what? Do them in the land whether you what? So you can't do them if you're not taught them. Is that right? So if we're not having Bible class for the whole summer, then how can you do them? Well, I can do what I already know uh, that I've been taught, what, from the previous year? <laughs> you know, we have to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them what? Slip. And it takes time for God to put in our spirit what we have been taught to where it becomes part of our spirit. It becomes second nature to us like breathing. It takes time. You can't get it overnight. You don't get it necessarily all in one Bible class. It has to get in your spirit. That's why when we teach Bible class, one pastor said he uh, saw me teach, he watches 
We teach regularly on, online. He said he notices that in every Bible class, I always do a recap. I said, yeah. I said, because my main concern in Bible class when we come back is how much the people of God have retained what we talked about the previous week. Because we deal with all kinds of demons every day. Is that right? We deal with white demons, we deal with black demons, we deal with ugly demons, we deal with pretty demons, we deal with bald-headed demons, we deal with long-haired demons, we deal with weave-wearing demons, wig-wearing demons, we deal with big lip demons, big nose demons, we deal with all kinds of stuff. Do you say amen? So my concern when we come for Bible class is are you at the same level when we concluded that in the previous Bible class? So that's why I always do a recap of what we covered because, you know, your mind has to be renewed and a lot of times because of what we've been dealing with all day long and all week long, we come to Bible class and the word of God's going forth, you can feel your mind being centered back centered to where it's supposed to be. Can we say amen? You know, so that's, that's, that, that's why I only do that. And the pastor said he didn't realize that. So yeah, that, I'm always concerned about that. How much, uh, because it takes time for it to get in our spirit. Especially if we're not reading during the week. <laughs> we say amen. Now if you read during the week, or if you just go over the notes during the week, when you come to Bible class, you will be more ready than you would if you just came in cold turkey. You know, so that's why we need to give attendance to reading and, and these type of things. And also fasting and praying. I'm very proud of young people. The, uh, what is it, the Jadig? <laughs> the what? Yadig? Young apostolic what? Young adult, deeply in God, into God. Is that right? Hey, whatever gets you there. Can we say amen? And that's doing it. It's a blessing. All right. Well, um, he says, to teach you that you might do them in the land whether you go to possess it. Verse 2, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy sons and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. What a powerful verse. Uh, to fear the Lord, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, and to not only that, but to pass them on. Verse number three. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with what? I don't know any backslider that's happy. I don't. Maybe you know some. <laughs> but in 35 years, I don't know any that are happy. None. Um, what I'm saying is that if you follow the word of God, as he said in verse 3, here therefore Israel, observe to do it, that it may be well with thee. I don't know any backslider that it is well with them. You say amen? Oh, they might have a lot of money. They might have a fine house, fine car. It may appear on the surface that all is well. But all is not well. It's not. It's not well. Unless the word of God is, God is a liar. It's not well. Yeah. There's one backslider uh, we see frequently. Every time we see him, he breaks down crying. <laughs> he needs to stop crying and repent. Can we say amen? <laughs> you know, that's what, he needs, that's what he needs to do. I see different ones. And they, they, you know, now, now you just need to... You, Repent, but I don't know any of them, and I know quite a few back, quite a few backsliders. I know a whole lot of them, <laughs> whole lot. <laughs> 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 
and they are not doing well. Because how can you do well when you walk out on God? They're not doing well. They may want to appear that they're doing well, but they're not doing well. Deep down within, they, they're not doing well. Because if you want to do well, you hear and observe to do the statutes and laws of God, that it may be what? Well with thee, and that, thou, that ye may increase mightily. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be where? In thy heart. Verse 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou what? Sittest in thy house when thou what? Walkest by the way. When thou liest down and when thou what? Rises up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. Talk of them. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Shalt talk of them when thou sittest where? In thine house. Just sitting around casually talking about the things of God. Passing them on to their children. We were at the funeral yesterday and, and Ebony, um, is that her name, Ebony? Uh, I remember when she was born, she was sickly all the time. The little girl had such a difficult time uh, growing up. And, and I do remember as, as she testified at her grandmother's funeral that her grandmother prayed, would pray for her as a little girl when she was hurting. And she felt uh, safe and felt that there was hope because grandmother was talking to God. And she got up and testified that I, have, I was healed because of my grandmother talking to God. And she said, I will never forget that for the rest of my life. I hope she don't. <laughs> I hope she don't. For her sake, she better not. You know. But that's what Mother Wilson put in her by just praying. You know, praying. And uh, it's amazing how much of a prayer warrior she was and how many backsliders was in her family. And, 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 and the bishop actually uh, testified about how she prayed her husband out of prison because he told the pastor, my wife prayed me out of prison. <laughs> Mrs. Wilson was a prayer warrior. And when the bishop was preaching, you could see the condemnation over the, almost the entire people at the funeral because a lot of them were former members of Greater Bible Way Temple. And he was preaching and saying that this woman loved God. She set the example for everybody, and she sure did because I was there. It's too bad that when she used to run with my grandmother that she, my grandmother didn't find God like she did because she changed her life. Pray. See, when your children see you pray, and I remember when God called me to the ministry and was talking to me about uh, my family, he said, what's going to help your children is that they're going to see you pray see you as a minister and you better live this life because if you don't, I'm going to do to you what I've done to these other folk. And he showed me what he did to them other folk. And I said, Lord, you will never have any problem with me. And you know, he didn't say, well, that's good. I appreciate that. He said, I better not. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. That's why you think I'm so serious about being saved. I have a good time. I'm smiling. Can we say amen? Because I, you know, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitied every groan. Long as I live, trouble rise, I will hasten to his throne. But he ain't playing. Can we say amen? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mama was good to us, but she didn't play, did she? No. You crack you upside your head with the baseball bat, and if the police come, she'd have something for him, too. That's why in my day, the police didn't come. In my day. <laughs> You know, well, uh, she prayed. She's a prayer warrior, you know. And so our children are watching us. They're seeing us. 
And if, uh, and, and, and God forbid, if they have a parent that's a backslider. Isn't that something? But if they got one parent that's saved, where they can see God, they'll be able to see God in the godly parent and they'll be able to see the devil in the ungodly parent. And it will have an impact. So you don't have to worry. Can we say amen? Because my father wasn't saved. My father was the biggest devil in Jackson. <laughs> but I remember my mother praying. And that had an impact. Because all of us have been prayed into the church by somebody. Can we say amen? <laughs> oh yeah, by somebody. Well, we need to talk about them to our children. The things that God has done for us. Mama, how did we get? Honey, the Lord did this for us. God did this. Let me tell you. And, and, and it is something about the story of what God has done in the life of somebody. It lasts forever. It never passes. It's in somebody's heart somewhere. You can say amen. It don't, it don't never get old. True gospel music never gets old, you know, because God don't get old. The Holy Ghost doesn't get old. Can we say amen? You know, it don't get old. Well, I think we are finished here. Um, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13 to 28. We're going to move a little faster now because we only got, we only got about three verses left. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Verse 13 through 28. See, this is why the apostles trained those that were underneath them because they understood these things. Jesus was the greatest successor of truth that he handed it down to his apostles because they followed this principle. We're supposed to follow it today too, but some of them are not following. Deuteronomy 11, verse 13, let's read. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart, and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine, thy oil, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. In other words, you're going to prosper. I'm going to supply your needs because they needed God to send rain. Let me say amen. There was no dressing up like an Indian and dancing for the rain God to bring rain. They had to rely on God. And God said, if you do what you're supposed to do, I will do what I'm supposed to do. I will supply your needs. Um, verse 16. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not what? deceived and ye turn aside and serve other gods and what? Oh, if you take heed to yourself, you ain't got to worry about nobody tricking you, deceiving you. All right? People get deceived because they're not what? Taking heed to themselves. Let's read. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, that the land yield not her fruit. Unless she perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord given you. I had a woman that called the church, uh, left me a message, and she said, God told her to call and tell me that if my people, which I call by his name, humble themselves and pray, seek their face, turn their wicked ways, then shall hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal the land, that the land can be healed, the world can be saved. All we have to do is all the church folk get together. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And as you hung up. Lord have mercy. Uh, and she said a whole bunch of other stuff too. I was just listening. You know, at first she called, she said she had a question. And then she went on this rhetoric rampage about what we can do to, I don't know, eradicate hunger. I don't know, you know, and all these type of things. You know, strange, I'll tell you, we say amen. Strange people. Well, uh, <laughs> Uh, that's not going to happen. Is that right? Um, but there are certain things happening in the earth because of man's sins. 
I believe that. Because sin has an adverse effect uh, upon man, upon his environment, upon our land, all these things. All right? So the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. All right? Verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontless between your ears. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou what? Rises up and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children and the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if ye shall diligently keep all of these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him, then shall the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and ye shall possess greater nations, mightier than what? Yourselves, how does that apply to us? We will be able to defeat whatever the enemy brings against us. Whatever he brings against us. Verse 24, every place whereupon the sole of your feet shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon as he hath said unto you. Behold, I set before you this day, what? Blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a what? Curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have what? That's what the backslider has done. That's why we say the backslider is not doing well. They are cursed because they turned away from what? The commandments of God. Well, let's look at David's version. Let's go to Psalm 78, verse 1 through 7. And we have to wrap it up here because I'm quite sure our 36 minutes have passed. Psalm 78, verse 1 through 7. Look at what David said. Two places in the Psalms where this is written. Psalm 78, 1 through 7. Teaching them to the children. All right, let's read. Give ear. O oh, my people, to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. What God is saying, incline your ear. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which ye have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he had done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Why? That the generation to come might know them, even the children of which should be born, who should arise and declare to them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep what? I like that scripture, Psalm 78, verse 1 through 7. Isaiah chapter 28, verse number 9. Amen. I was studying this Bible class when I was at work. <laughs> Prisoners all around me. I was looking at the word. Every now and then I look up, see if somebody's trying to escape. And I get right back in there. Isaiah 28, verse number 9. All right. And we have two scriptures after this and we're done. Well, we'll just read one more. We're not going to read St. John. I don't think we have time for that. Well, I think we have to. That's what the words of Jesus. Isaiah 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And he's going to answer his question. What's the answer? Yeah. Them that are weaned from the milk and what? 
Now who are they? Babes in Christ, the children. That's who God's teaching, to understand doctrine. We don't teach any doctrine in this church. Well, then you ain't got no church. We say amen. You know, whom shall he teach knowledge and to whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, drawn from the breast. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Last days of Bishop Pada, he drilled this scripture into us. Ministers meeting. Second Timothy two and two. Drill this scripture in us. And that's why we're reading it tonight. Because he as the father handed it down to his children. And now I'm passing it on to you, down to you. Let's read verse two. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to what? Faithful man who shall be able to what? Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. The same commit thou to what? Faithful man. Paul, the first generation, pass on to Timothy, who passed it on to the faithful men, which were the pastors in his diocese, and them teaching others also are the members of their churches. If we just do that, we will all have the same thing. But we don't because it's not being done. But thank God somebody's doing it. We're doing it. Can we say amen? St. John chapter 17. And you should read this entire chapter. But uh, we're not going to read the entire chapter. We're going to jump around here. The words of Jesus. St. John chapter 17. Talking about how he handed his truth over to the apostles. St. John chapter 17, last verse. Let's read, um, let me see here. Let's pick it up, verse six. St. John 17 and verse six, let's read. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. What name is that? That's Jesus, because the Father and the Son have the same name. Is that right? Name Jesus. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which what? Thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. They have believed that thou didst what? Send me. And that's all we'll read. You read that entire chapter. He goes off into that uh, uh, constantly. But the point is, is that Jesus didn't come with his own words. He received the words from who? The Father. God in the office of fatherhood put the words in the Son so that they were not man's words. They were whose words? God's words. And he was God. He said they have received them. And why did he do it like that? So they can take it and what? Pass it on. Because he told them, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then he said, teaching them to what? Observe all things that I have commanded you. He says, Lord, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world. Well, we're going to conclude tonight. Are there any questions? Look at the little bitty note I had. Isn't that something? Praise the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, Elohim is just simply God. All right, and uh, Elohim is used some 2,700 times in the Bible. Um, and it has to do with um, basically just God. And so um, when he revealed himself, well, he, Adam knew him as Elohim. Abraham knew him as Elohim. All, everybody knew him as Elohim that were of his children because they all recognized that he was God and that he was the only God. 
Anybody else? Yes. That's right. That's what Paul said. Think on things that are lovely, things that are true, things that are honest, things that have good report, things that are pure. If there be any virtue in your praise, think on these things. That's exactly right. Because they're not his. Yes, they are his people uh, in the sense that they were Israelites, but they were not really his to do his will. Well, it's just like this. Uh, the foundation, uh, foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, really his. Or in other words, they're not the ones that are going to make it. When we talk about his people, we're talking about those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay. Now, everybody that's baptized in Jesus' name before the Holy Ghost is a child of God by the new birth. But are they one of his chosen that will make it in the end? Okay. Um, you just can't just use that verse. That verse has to be qualified because Jesus said, my sheep here my voice and I know them and they follow me. Okay, so um, yes, Israel was his people. Yes, his people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they've reject, rejected knowledge but at the same time uh, they are his people because of the experiences that they've had with him but they are not his people as far as them making it in the end. And loving him as he loves them, you see. So see, when you just take one scripture out and, use, and, and just use that, just take that one scripture out, um, then it, it gives the appearance that, um, that them being God's people means that they're saved. They're not saved. You can be a child of God and be a backslidden child of God, be a disobedient child of God, or be a destroyed child of God. And that's, an, uh, uh, but being a destroyed child of God, backslidden child of God, lost child of God, is a child of God that is not really one of his. You know. So, you know, that, th those terms have to be qualified uh, in the light of the other scriptures um, that deals with um, like Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, or those he had chosen before the foundation of the world. Yeah, those are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they're rejecting knowledge. Yeah, they're called, he calls them my people, but they're not his chosen. They're not the one he chose before the foundation of the world. And who are those that he chose? Those that he already knows they're going to make it. All right? Yes. Oh, that's fine. That's all right. No, uh, and I'll give you a scripture. Uh, the seven sons of Sceva. When uh, Paul was casting out devils and uh, the, seven, the uh, seven sons of Sceva went and tried to cast out the devil out of a person and the demon said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> 
So no, they don't. They don't. They don't have. They don't have that power. No, the pow- the, the name Jesus. Um, um, if they have not been baptized in that name, they're not part of that name. If they are not saved, that they're not part of that name. So no. They can't. Um, yes. Right. Right, yeah, God can, God can do anything, but you have to think of it also like this, is that we're always praying. The saints are always praying for somebody to be healed, for somebody to be delivered. Exactly. Yes, Philip? Get your hand raised? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yes, Kayla. Difference between miracle signs and wonders? I guess some people interpret it the wrong way. I can't speak concerning them because I don't know what type of interpretation they have. Um, but um, uh, miracles, signs, and wonders, uh, the greatest miracle is being saved. Signs is simply what the Bible has dictated to us that what would happen and we look out and see the things happening. Signs has to do with what the Bible said will happen at a given particular time. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And wonders is anything you wonder about. (laughs) You know. So I don't think there's any real deep revelation in trying to decipher between the difference between signs and wonders and miracles. You know, because I think uh, almost any um, sign can be a wonder, you know, different things like that. So I don't don't know what they're talking about. Um, Yes? Yeah, that's what Jesus said, that a, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. He said, but the only sign that should be given is the sign of Jonah. That as Jonah was in the well for three days, three nights, so the Son of Man. So what he's saying, the only sign that they need to be concerned about is the gospel. They need to be saved. Because, uh, uh, you know, the, the greatest miracle is, is for them to repent. You know, and God, um, that, that's tempting God, you know, and and uh, so, yeah, that's, that's the generation, but Jesus said an uh, evil generation seeking after the signs. That's evil, you know. That's the same as the Satan coming to Jesus, tempting them, saying, if you be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. You know, jump down off this mountain. Uh, the angel shall bear you up, you know. So God doesn't have to do anything. People being healed somewhere, people being delivered somewhere, you know, just because a person don't see it in their own little small world, <laughs> this is a big world, you know. And people think that their little small corner is the entire world, you know. That's the arrogance and the deception of the fallen nature. That's deception, you know. Ain't nobody getting healed because you ain't seen nobody healed in your church. What are you talking about, you know? But... Um, you know, the younger generation. And why do they do that? Because they haven't been taught. That's why. If they'd been taught, they'd realize that miracles don't happen today as the same reason why they happen in Bible days. And, and when people start talking about that, you tell them this, that if they have studied their Bible or been taught, they would know that the book of Acts covers the first 30 years of the New Testament church. And there's only... 13 miraculous happenings 
recorded in the book of Acts over a period of 30 years. And people want to see it every time they come to church? That's not realistic. <laughs> so, young people. <laughs> I'm glad our young people are like that. They need a lot of help and deliverance. All right? So, anybody else? Questions? All right. Well, uh, we'll take our offering. Thank you for your attention. It's almost.